Jonathan Small. Mahomet Singh. Abdullah Khan. Dost Akbar. The Sign of the Fall. Part One. Timber Toe. Sherlock Holmes took his bottle from the corner of the mantelpiece and his hypodermic syringe from its neat Morocco case. With his long, white, nervous fingers, he adjusted the delicate needle and rolled back his left shirt cuff. For some little time, his eyes rested thoughtfully upon the sinewy forearm and wrist, all dotted and scarred with innumerable puncture marks. Finally, he thrust the sharp point home and pressed down the tiny piston. Which is it today? Morphine or cocaine? Cocaine. 7% solution. Would you care to try it? No, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> perhaps you're right, Watson. Uh, yes, I, I suppose its influence uh, is physically uh, a bad one. You suppose? If you have any doubts in the matter, I should be delighted to dispel them. I find it so stimulating and clarifying to the mind, however, that its, its, its secondary action is a matter of... <laughs> Small moments. Small <laughs> moment. It's a pathological and morbid process. It involves increased tissue change and leaves a permanent weakness. And you know what a black reaction comes on you afterwards. Uh. <laughs> For God's sake, count the cost! My mind rebels at stagnation. You know, give me problems, give me work, give me the most obtruse cryptogram and the most intricate analysis, and I can dispense with artificial stimulants. <laughs> Oh, I crave for mental exaltation. <laughs> and what do you present me with? <laughs> this. A study in scarlet. Yes. Uh, uh, mm. uh, Lucy was silent, but her blushing cheek and her bright, happy eyes showed only too clearly that her young heart was no longer her own. <laughs> Romantic drivel! But the romance was there. I couldn't tamper with the facts. Oh, well, some fact should be suppressed. I can't believe that. The only point in the case which deserved mention was the analytical reasoning I used to unravel it. Oh, I see. Every line should have been about you. And you called yourself a scientific detective. I thought this would please you. I'm sorry. I was mistaken. Roll up, roll up, that's right, ladies and gentlemen. As I live and breathe, and I wouldn't tell you an old lie now, would I? The only one in captivity. The only one ever tamed. The only one ever taken from its own heathen lands and brought into civilization. Don't alarm yourself, madam. It is securely chained up in there. Oh, yes, sir. Bond to the finest British steel. It only ever got out once. And you can all see what happened then, can't you? Oh, yes, exactly. So come along, come on, roll up. Only a penny to see something you remember the rest of your days. Roll up, roll up. Thank you, sir, madam. Thank you. In you go. That's it, madam. In you go. That's it. Holmes. Oh. Holmes. What is it? I want to ask you something. Well? If I'm to continue as your chronicler, I want to make sure that I present your methods accurately. Yes, good. Observation and deduction. 
I've heard you say that it's difficult for a man to have any object in daily use without somehow impressing his individuality on it. Yes, yeah, well, give it to me, Watson. I beg your pardon? The object, the test piece, whatever it is. I cannot emulate the music hall mind reader. I do not work blindfolded. <clears throat> Here. Uh, this has recently come into my possession. What can you tell me about its previous owner? Well, I can tell you that his watch has prevented me from taking another dose of cocaine, as you so transparently intended it should. <clears throat> yes, now. Hmm. Mm hmm. Hmm. <sighs> Take it. There are hardly any data. Oh. So what about your theory? Uh, precision, Watson. Hardly any, not none. Now, subject to your correction, I should judge that the previous owner of that watch was your elder brother, a man of untidy habits, very untidy and careless. He was left with good prospects, but he threw away his chances, lived for some time in poverty with occasional short bursts of prosperity, and finally, taking to drink, he died. That is all I can gather. This is unworthy of you, Holmes. You made inquiries into the history of my unhappy brother. And now you pretend to have deduced the knowledge in some fanciful way. I didn't think you capable of descending to something like that. Oh, my dear doctor. Pray accept my apologies. Viewing the matter as an abstract problem, I never thought how personal and painful a thing it might be to you. I assure you that I never even knew you had a brother until you handed me that watch. Then how did you get those facts? You were correct in every particular. Well, the date of the watch is nearly 50 years back, and it carries the initials H.W. The W obviously suggests your own name. Your father has been dead many years, and jewellery usually descends to the eldest son. Uh, to deduce a brother is no major achievement. That the brother is no longer alive is strongly suggested by the simple fact that you are now in possession of his timepiece. And your insights as to his character? Well, look how the case is dented and scratched. Yes, it's marked all over. It's been kept in the same pocket as, as keys, coins and other hard objects. It's no great feat to assume that only a careless man treats a 50-guinea watch in so cavalier a fashion. The poverty? Open it. And when a pawnbroker takes a watch, he scratches the number of the ticket on the inside of the case. Now, there are no less than four such numbers visible there. Hmm? Inference that your brother was often at low water. Huh? Secondary inference? And that he had occasional bouts of prosperity. Or he couldn't have redeemed the pledge. Exactly. And finally, if you look at the inner plate which contains the keyhole... Uh, here, here. Uh, use my lens. Mm. There are more scratches. Hundreds of them. Hmm. Marks with a key has missed its target. You'll never see a drunkard's watch without them. <laughs> huh. Where's the mystery in all this? You're right. I'm sorry. I should have more faith in your powers. Yeah, what's the use of having powers when one has no field upon which to exert them? <laughs> oh, look out there. Was ever such a dreary, dismal, unprofitable world? What could be more hopelessly prosaic and material? Crime is commonplace. Existence is commonplace. And no qualities except those which are commonplace of any function upon Earth. <laughs> but surely... <sighs> Watson? Good night. Tonga. You see that light? That's where it is. You know what to do. <coughs> Up you go, then. And be careful. <laughs> K. 
Come in, Mrs. Hudson. Good news, sir. A client. Oh, thank heaven. A young lady, well-dressed and rather reserved. Uh, I'll tell him. <clears throat> Please wait a moment or two. Then show her up. Yes, Doctor. Let's hope he finds her problem interesting. Amen. Holmes? Holmes? A client? Holmes? I'm going to open this door. Very well. Oh, God. Holmes, there's a client here. A lady. Be out here in two minutes. Come in. Miss Mary Morstan. Ah, please come in, Miss Morstan. I am Dr. John Watson. Mr. Holmes will be here in a moment. Good morning, Doctor. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Yes, thank you. Please, sit down. Thank you. Whatever it is that's disturbing you, I'm sure that Mr. Holmes will be able to help. You're very kind. I've come here because you and Mr. Holmes once acted for my employer, Mrs. Cecil Forrester. Mrs. Forrester? Of Lower Camberwell. She was much impressed by your kindness and skill. It was a very simple case. <sighs> Miss Mary Morstan, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. An exceedingly simple affair. She did not think so. Well, nonetheless. <laughs> well, at least you cannot say the same of my problem. Uh, please continue, Miss Morstan. Briefly, the facts are these. My father was an officer in the 34th Bombay Infantry. Ah. Dr. Watson? The doctor has also served in India. Oh. Yes. Pray continue. My mother died when I was a child, and I was sent home to England to live. I was placed in a boarding establishment in Edinburgh, and I remained there until I was 17. My father obtained 12 months' leave and came home to London, telegraphing me that he had arrived all safe and directing me to come down at once to the Langham Hotel. His message was full of kindness and love. I drove to the Langham and was informed that Captain Morstan had gone out the night before and had not returned. I waited all day, but there was no news of him. And that night, on the advice of the manager of the hotel, I communicated with the police. <laughs> Their inquiries led to no result, and nothing more has been heard of my unfortunate father. He came home with his heart full of hope to find some peace, some comfort, and instead... The date? He disappeared upon the 3rd of December, 1878. Ten years ago? But... What happened to his luggage? It had remained at his hotel. There was nothing in it to suggest a clue. Clothes and books and a number of curiosities from the Andaman Islands. Mm -hmm. Was that his posting? He was one of the officers in charge there. <sighs> it's a penal colony, Holmes. Hmm? Terrible place by all accounts. So Papa used to say in his letters. Uh, well, had your father any friends in town? Only one that I know of, Major Sholto, a fellow officer from the penal colony. The Major had retired some little time before and lived at Upper Norwood. I communicated with him, of course. But he didn't even know that my father was in England. A singular case, eh, Holmes? Mm. I haven't yet described to you the most singular part. Well, then pray do so. About six years ago, a notice appeared in the Times asking for the address of Miss Mary Morstan and stating that it would be to her advantage to come forward. Oh, indeed. Do um, you happen to recall the precise date? The 4th of May, 1882. Here is the cutting. Oh, very good. Thank you. By that date, I'd entered the family of Mrs Cecil Forrester in the post of governess. On her advice, I published my address in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. What result? The very same day. This box arrived in the post. Ah, may I? Thank you. Good heavens. My reaction exactly. I don't believe I've seen a more lustrous pearl. Or a larger. It's beautiful. 
Since then, every year upon the same date. Well, you can see for yourself. That's fascinating. I took them to an expert. They are exactly matched. And of some considerable value. Yes. Yes, but it is not this which brings you to me, Miss Morstan. Something else has occurred. Hmm? Something rather more disquieting than anonymous gifts. You are correct, Mr Holmes. This morning I received this letter. Perhaps you will read it for yourself. Hmm. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, uh, the envelope too, please. Thank you. Yes, postmark London Southwest, July the 7th. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Man's thumb mark on corner, probably postman. Yeah, best quality paper. Envelopes at sixpence a packet. <laughs> this particular man and his stationery. Yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Watson. <clears throat> no address. Be at the third pillar from the left outside the Lyceum Theatre tonight at seven o'clock. If you are distrustful, bring two friends. You are a wronged woman and shall have justice. Do not bring police. Your unknown friend. Hmm. The same hand as the address on the pearl box. Well, this is a very pretty little mystery. Hey, well, what do you intend to do, Miss Morstan? Well, that is exactly what I came to ask you. I shall be guided by your advice. And Mr Holmes, of course. <laughs> Oh, we shall certainly go, Miss Morstan. You and I? <laughs> ah, but your correspondent says two friends, does he not? He does. Mm, well, then, let me think. Uh, well, you and I, and... Uh... <clears throat> Why, Dr Watson is the very man. He and I have worked together before. Oh, Dr Watson, would you come? I shall be proud and happy if I can be of any service. You are both very kind. If I'm here at six, it will do, I suppose. Oh, you must not be later. Goodbye, Miss Morstan. Until six, then. Please try to set your mind at rest. I shall. Thank you, Dr Watson. Au revoir, Miss Morstan. Au revoir. Hmm, what a very attractive woman. Is she? I did not observe. You really are an automaton, a calculating machine. <laughs> Watson. There's something positively inhuman about you at times. Keep that thing away from me. Watch your mouth, Smith. All right, Tom. He doesn't like you, Smith, and no more do I. I should be charging you double. You've been well enough paid. Will she be ready? How many times? She'll be ready. And you'll keep her out of sight till then. Do you think I'm some kind of fool? <laughs> keep it away! <laughs> I was beginning to think that you were going to be late. And you were looking forward to riding off alone with a decorative, Miss Morstan. I thought you hadn't observed that. Ooh, writing it up already, eh, Watson? More gems for your avid public? <laughs> <laughs> her expression was sweet and amiable, and her large blue eyes were singularly spiritual and sympathetic. In an experience of women which extends over many nations and three separate continents, I have never... <laughs> if you say one word, I swear I walk out of the door. Poor Miss M.T. is a good fellow. <coughs> you know, there's no great mystery in this matter. What? You've solved it already? Mm, no, that would be too much to say. I've discovered a, a suggestive fact. Sug that's all. Suggestive fact? Well, actually, a, a very suggestive fact. Major John Sholto, late of the 34th Bombay Infantry... Thank you, Doctor. ...died on the 28th of April, 1882. I may be very obtuse, Holmes, but I fail to see... No. No, wait a minute. Miss Morstan received her first pearl at the beginning of May that same year. Within a week of the death of her father's only friend in England. Very suggestive. Now, it's nearly six. Be so good as to bring your heaviest stick. <clears throat> You're anticipating danger? I believe we are in for a serious night's work.
I have something else to show you, gentlemen. This is a paper which I found in Papa's things. I've always assumed that it was just another souvenir. But since it is a little out of the ordinary, I thought you might wish to see it. Oh, you certainly are a model clad. And this is paper of native Indian manufacture. It has at some time been pinned to a board. Your father evidently held it to be of some importance, for it's been kept carefully in a pocketbook. Yes, that's where I found it. Yeah, one side is clean as the other, drawn in pencil but almost faded. When I first saw it, I thought it was a pattern, but it's actually a diagram or plan of some kind. Matters Indian are the doctor's territory. Thank you. Yes, I'm sure you're right, Miss Mawson. Let's say that this is a plan of some large and complex building. Interesting, this cross in the centre, eh, Holmes? And the words 337 from left. Uh, I confess to being more intrigued by the inscription at the bottom. <sighs> Strange collection of names. Mm. Jonathan Small, Mohammed Singh, Ab Abdullah Khan, Jost. Akbar. Yeah, one Westerner, two Mohammedans, and uh, what about the fourth, Watson? Oh, it's a sort of Mohammedan-Sikh hybrid. Do you know any of these people, Miss Morstan? I'm afraid not. Nor did my father ever mention them in his letters. Oh, what about this symbol? I've never seen anything like it anywhere else. Hmm, nor have I. Four crosses in a line with their arms touching. And written through them... The sign of the four. What do you suppose is going to happen, Mr. Holmes? Uh, patience, Miss Morstan. It is pointless to speculate without data. Uh, it's eerie, isn't it? Something ghost-like in the way the light from the shop windows cut through the fog. People walk out of the gloom into the light and then back into darkness again. A microcosm of all human life. Oh, Watson, you're an incurable romantic. I agree with the doctor. I hate these steamy, foggy nights. It's past seven. I hope this whole thing isn't some kind of hoax. I believe not. To your left, hmm? small, dark man, dressed as a, as a coachman. He's been watching us carefully. And here he comes. Are you the parties who come with Miss Morstan? I am, Miss Morstan. These two gentlemen are my friends. Uh, you will excuse me, Miss, but I was to ask you to give me your word that neither of your companions is a police officer. I give you my word on that. Uh, this way, please. <laughs> Look at it, Tonga. Look at it. <laughs> After all this time. So we'll be out of this damn place. We can live like kings, like Maharajas, eh? <laughs> We've done it, Tonga. Vengeance for the four. Where do you think he's taking us? Our quest does not appear to lead us to very fashionable regions. The fog's got thicker. I can't see a thing. We're in Robsard Street. Where's that? South of the river. We crossed over Vauxhall Bridge, then turned into Wandsworth Road, then Priory Road, Larkhall Lane and Stockwell Place. Ah, now we're turning again Cold Harbour Lane. Do you know every by street in London by heart, Mr Holmes? It's a hobby of mine. We're stopping. Uh, dull brick houses, new, I think. Hardly any lights. There's a door opening. Someone's coming. Good Lord. Do you see, Holmes? I see. What? Whatever is it? Someone singularly incongruous for the inhabitant of a third-rate suburban dwelling house. Good evening, Miss Morstan. Gentlemen, the sahib awaits you. Your servant, Miss Morstan. Your servant. Your servant, gentlemen. Welcome to my little sanctum. Thank you, Kitmutka. Sahib. A small place, Miss Morstan, but furnished to my own liking. 
An oasis of art in the howling deserts of South London. It's beautiful. It seemed to me that if I could not take myself to India, I could at least bring a little of India to me. Mr Thaddeus Sholto, that is my name. Sholto? Quite so. You are Miss Morstan, of course. And these gentlemen? Mr Sherlock Holmes and Dr Watson. A doctor, eh? Mm. Have you your stethoscope? I have uh, grave doubts as to my mitral valve. Might I ask you, would you have the kindness... Uh, Mr Sholto, this is hardly the time. Perhaps not, perhaps not. Uh, possibly later? You will excuse my anxiety, Miss Morstan. I'm a great sufferer and the heart is so vulnerable. Mr Sholto, why did you not simply ask Miss Morstan to come directly to this address? Hmm? Why all the secrecy? Because I feared she might bring unpleasant people with her. I am a man of retiring and refined taste. There is nothing more unaesthetic than a policeman. <laughs> Quite. I seldom come into contact with the rough crowd. I live, as you see, with some little atmosphere of elegance around me. I may call myself a patron of the arts. It is my weakness. That landscape is a genuine coron. You will excuse me, Mr Sholto, but... I am here at your request to learn something which you desire to tell me. It is very late, and I should desire the interview be as short as possible. At the best, it must take some time, for we shall certainly have to go to Norwood. To Norwood? To see Brother Bartholomew. He is very angry with me for taking the course which I thought right. I had quite high words with him last night. If we are to go to Norwood, it would perhaps be as well to start at once. Oh, no! Uh, that would hardly do... I don't know what he would say if I brought you to him in that sudden way. No, I must prepare you first. Oh, yes. Then pray do so. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, Miss Morstan, I trust you have no objection to the balsamic odour of eastern tobacco smoke? Uh, oh, thank you. I am a little nervous and I find my hooker an invaluable sedative. Very well. My father was, as you may have guessed, Major John Sholto, once of the Indian Army. He retired some eleven years ago and came to live at Pondicherry Lodge in Upper Norwood. He had prospered in India and brought back with him considerable wealth, a large collection of valuable curiosities and a staff of native servants. We lived in great luxury. We came to realise that some mystery, some positive danger, overhung our father. Mm -hmm. He was very fearful of going out alone and was greatly distrustful of strangers. Uh, on one occasion, he actually fired his revolver at a wooden-legged man, a harmless tradesman. Uh, we had to pay a large sum to hush the matter up. Mm -hmm. Early in 1882, my father received a letter from India. <clears throat> my God! What is it, Father? Bad news? <gasps> Father! Oh, oh. He had suffered for years from an enlarged spleen, but after this attack he grew rapidly worse, and from that day he sickened to his death. What was in the letter? I do not know. Mr. Sholto. Truly. At the moment of the attack we were too occupied to read it, and afterward my father ordered it destroyed. Please carry on, Mr. Sholto. Yes. After a few months, my brother and I were informed that my father was beyond all hope and that he wished to make a last communication to us. Bartholomew, that is. We are here, Father. I have only one thing which weighs on my mind at this supreme moment. Something I have never told you. When we were in India together, my friend, Captain Morstan, and I came into possession of a considerable treasure. Treasure? I have brought it back with me here to England. Here? You brought it to this house? Bartholomew. Yes. When Morstan returned home, he came straight here to claim his share. We had a difference of opinion and exchanged heated words. Morstan's heart was weak, and his anger was too great for it to bear. He 
I died. Father. Are you all right, Miss Morstan? Yes. Yes, Doctor. I knew in my heart that he was dead. I can give you every information. And what is more, I can do you justice. And will too. Whatever Brother Bartholomew may say. Never mind your information. Why was this not reported to the authorities? I cannot say. Mr. Shorto, what was the nature of this difference of opinion? My father did not tell us. What became of Major Morstan's body? I do not know. Your father, sir, behaved in an appalling fashion. Yes, yes, I am afraid he did. Perhaps if I had been there... But Brother Bartholomew and I were away at university. Did Major Sholto tell you anything more about my father? By this time he was extremely weak. He spoke only of you. Of me? You, my sons, you must find Morstan's daughter, his orphan. The cursed greed which has been my besetting sin through life has kept from her what is rightfully hers. Half, at least, of the treasure belongs to that girl. That is, give me that case. Yes, Father. Show me that. No. Oh. Oh. I, I got that necklace out with the design of sending it to her. But I could not bear to part with it. These pearls must be worth a fortune. Uh, it is not one thousandth part of the whole. Swear to me that Morstan's daughter will have her fair share. I swear. Where is this treasure? It has lain hidden all these years. No one else must know. Put your ears down to my mouth. The treasure. Father! Keep him out! Why? For God's sake! Keep him out! No! We both stared round at the window. A face was looking in at us, out of the darkness. It was a bearded face, deathly pale with wild, cruel eyes and an expression of concentrated malevolence. My brother and I rushed to the window, but the man was gone. When we returned to my father, his head had dropped and his pulse had ceased to beat. We searched the garden but found no sign of the intruder, save that under the window a single footmark was visible in the flower bed. But in the morning... What occurred in the morning? My father's room was found to have been broken into. His cupboards and boxes had been rifled. Was there no clue as to who might have done this? Fixed to my father's chest was this scrap of paper. Neither Bartholomew nor I had ever seen its like before. Yeah, but I have. Hmm? Mr. Holmes? Four crosses in a line, their arms touching and written through them. The sign of the four. The journey to Norwood will not take long, and there is only a little more of the story to acquaint you with. For weeks and for months after our father's death, we dug and delved in every part of the garden and the house without discovering the treasure. Over the pearl necklace, my brother Bartholomew and I had some little discussion. Mm. From what you have told us, he seems to have inherited something of your father's attitude. Between friends, yes, you are quite correct. It was all I could do to persuade him to let me send Miss Morstan a detached pearl at fixed intervals so that at least she might never feel destitute. It was a kindly thought. Oh. It was extremely kind of you. Yesterday, I learned that an event of extreme importance had occurred. Mm. Brother Bartholomew had found the treasure. Mm. I, I instantly communicated with Miss Morstan and then went at once to repeat my views to my brother. Have you seen this treasure? Oh, oh yes. I, I helped lower the chest from its hiding place. It is very fine. Brother Bartholomew computes its value at not less than one half million sterling. Half a million? Oh. Miss Morstan is certainly one of the richest young ladies in the realm. Oh. Oh. 
Congratulations, Miss Morstan. <laughs> yes, congratulations. Dr. Watson. Uh, it's glorious news. Yes. And shortly we shall be in Norwood and can demand your share. You have done well, sir, from first to last. Oh. Mr. Sholto, you said earlier that when you met your brother last night, you quarrelled again. Bitterly. I'm afraid we shall not be welcome visitors. What a desolate place. Yeah. This garden must have been lovely once. <laughs> Looks as though all the moles in England have been let loose in it. It's the traces <laughs> of the treasure seekers. You must remember that we were six years looking for it. Uh, come along. We are expected. Dr. Watson. What is it, Miss Morstan? Oh, nothing. Forgive me. You're trembling. This place. It is the cold. You'll feel better inside the house. Yes. Please try not to be afraid. I am not afraid. Not while you are here. Oh, my dear. Come along. Where are the servants? Try again. Someone's coming. Mr. Thaddeus, sir, I'm so glad you've come. Mrs. Bernstein, whatever is the matter? Oh, please come quickly, sir. Something terrible's happened to Mr. Bartholomew. <coughs> Brother Bartholomew? Touch nothing! Oh. Oh, what's that smell? This is some kind of laboratory. Mr. Sholto, do not touch him. But... Watson, excuse me. Oh. <clears throat> He's been dead many hours. Why is he all twisted? Look at his face. What's this paper? Holmes? Yes, I see it. Here. The sign of the four. In God's name, what does it all mean? It means murder. Oh, I cannot stand it. I shall go mad. What is happening? What are you looking for? This. Like a thorn. It is a thorn. Uh, be uh, careful. It's poisoned. Things grow darker instead of clearer. Oh, on the contrary. Things clear every instant. <gasps> oh, oh, now, what is it now? The treasure is gone. <gasps> they have robbed him of the treasure. Do you mean to say it was in this room? Yes. The hiding place was above this very chamber. It has a false ceiling. See, there is the hole through which I helped Bartholomew lower the chest last night. I was the last person to see him. I heard him lock this door as I went downstairs. What time was that? It was ten o'clock. Uh, now he is dead, and the police will be called in, and I shall be suspected. I know that I shall go mad. Yes, you have no reason for fear, Mr. Sholto. No reason for fear. <laughs> Take my advice. Go down to the local station and report the matter to the police. Offer to assist them in every way. We shall wait here until your return. Yes, yes. Huh? I, I shall do as you say. Ah. I, I am innocent. They will see that I am innocent. I have nothing to fear. Yeah. Has he gone? Yes. <laughs> Isn't this splendid? <laughs> now, Watson, we have half an hour to ourselves. Let us make good use of it. More than one intruder, two. How did they come? How did they go? The door has not been opened since last night. Out of the window, yeah. mm. snibbed on the inner side. Framework is solid, no hinges exposed. Open it. No, no water pipe near, roof out of reach. Ah, single footmark on the sill. Mud from the rain last night. Coil of rope against the far wall. Stout hook. Yes, yes. Now the floor. Nothing. Nothing. Ha! What have you found? See, here, and here, and there, by the table. Those are not footprints. No, there's something much more valuable. It is the mark of the timber toe. A wooden stump. 
Didn't Sholto mention a wooden-legged man? Yes, it did. The late Major had an aversion to them, if you remember. Oh, my God. With good reason, seemingly. But how did he get in here? Through the window. But it was latched on the inside. I saw you open it. Besides, no one could scale that wall. It's impossible. But suppose you had an ally, huh? A friend with a rope. Uh, this rope. Two men? Hmm. One of whom tied the rope to this hook in the wall. I think if you were an active man, you might swarm up, wooden leg and all. Mm, and depart in the same fashion. Yeah, very good, Watson. Mm. Now, incidentally, our wooden-legged friend isn't a sailor. Now, his hands are too soft. There are flecks of skin and blood on this rope in several places. Well, what about this ally? Yes, the ally. Oh, he lifts the case from the regions of the commonplace. I fancy that this ally breaks fresh ground in the annals of crime in this country. How hmm. came he into the room? The door was locked, the window was inaccessible. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a chimney, the grate is far too small. Yes, yes, well then. Huh? I can't see it. Oh! Oh, yes, you can, but you will not apply my precept. How often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must, must be, be the, the truth. truth. Yeah. He came through the hole in the ceiling. Of course he did. Now, we shall now extend our researches to the room above, the secret attic. Now, I fancy this ladder must have been in place here. Mm, I'll pass you up the lamp when you're in position. Thank you. Careful, it's filthy. <coughs> Is that a trapdoor? Yes, yeah, onto the roof. Oh, yes, it opens far too easily. Look at the hinges. The rust is nearly fallen away. Mm, so it's been opened recently. But it's just a ventilator. Could you get through there? I don't believe so. I certainly couldn't. Yes, but somebody could. Now, let's see if we can find some other trace of our allies' individuality. In this dust, it shouldn't be difficult. <laughs> ah! What is it? Just here. A clear print. Hold up the lantern. Hmm? You see? Holmes. A child has done this terrible thing. One of you at the top of the stairs and one outside the room. Right. If Sholto confesses, I want to hear about it. Straight away. Right. Well, here's a business. Here's a pretty business. Hello. Who are you two? I think you must recollect me, Inspector Othelny Jones. <laughs> Why, of course I do. It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the theorist. Yeah. I'll never forget how you lectured us all on inferences and effects in the Bishopsgate jewel case. Mm. Well, it's true you set us on the right track, but you'll own now that it was more by good luck than good guidance. It was a piece of very simple reasoning. Oh, come now, come, come, come. Never be ashamed to own up. But what is all this? A bad business. Stern facts here. No room for theories. Lucky I happened to be at the station when the message arrived. And who are you? Dr. John Watson. Oh, a medical man, are you? Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think he died of? Yeah, this is hardly a case for us to theorise over. No, no. <laughs> Still, we can't deny that you hit the nail on the head sometimes. Door locked, I understand. Jewels missing. Well, how was the window? Uh, fastened, but there are marks on the sill. Well, if it was fastened, the marks have nothing to do with the matter. Common sense. Hmm. Oh, I... Have a theory. These flushes come upon me at times. Uh, what do you think of this? Sholto was on his own confession with his brother last night. The brother died in a fit on which Sholto walked off with the treasure. How's that? And then the dead man very considerately got up and locked the door from the inside. Oh, yeah, yeah. well, there is a flaw there, but well, I'm weaving my web around Thaddeus Sholto. The net begins to claw. You are not quite in possession of all the facts yet. No? No. This 
form. Uh, well, let me examine it. Which I firmly believe to be poisoned. Uh, well, yes, well, uh, better wait for the police, Doctor. It was in the dead man's neck. You don't say. Well, uh, you put it down uh, somewhere safe um, over there. And this paper inscribed, as you see it, was on the table. Uh, yes. It's, it's perfectly harmless. <clears throat> The sign of the four. How does that all fit into your theory? <laughs> Confirms it in every aspect. What? Oh, yes, oh, yes. Um, Constable, I'll uh, bring up Mr. Sholto. Uh, yes, Doctor, this is the very proof I need. The house is full of curiosities. Who better to leave these things than the man who used to live here? The only question is, how did he depart? No. No. Uh, I... Jones. Well, what is it? More reasoning? Uh, the solution to this problem is over your head. Now then, Mr. Holmes, there's no need for you. Oh. <laughs> yes, there's a hole in the ceiling. Oh, well done, Inspector. And a ladder. In here, in here, Constable. It's right there. I tell you, Constable, I had nothing to do with it, Inspector. Mr. Sholto, it is my duty to inform you that anything which you may say will be used against you. No. I arrest you in the Queen's name as being concerned in the death of your brother. Didn't I tell you, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson? Don't trouble yourself, Mr. Sholto. I think that I can engage to clear you of this charge. Don't promise too much, Mr. Theory. Not only will I clear him, Mr. Jones, but I will make you a free present of the name and description of one of the two people who were in this room last night. His name, I have... Every reason to believe is Jonathan Small. He's poorly educated, active, with his right leg off below the knee and wearing a wooden stump. He's middle-aged and has probably been a convict. There's a good deal of skin missing from the palms of his hands. The other person... Oh, yes, oh, yes, the other person... ...is a rather curious individual. <laughs> Take him away, Constable. Sir. No! Pity. Come along now, Please, sir. I had nothing Don't to do with it. Any trouble this way. Come on. Well, I've got my man. Good night to you, gentlemen. Good morning to you, Inspector. Huh? Ah. <laughs> that man is a fool. Oh, he has occasional glimmerings of reason. And you remember the old French philosopher. There are no fools so troublesome as those that have a little wit. <laughs> Very little in his case, I'd have thought. <laughs> Good old Watson. Holmes, hmm? how could you describe this wooden-legged man with such confidence? And what evidence is there to link him to the Jonathan Small whose name appears on that old map? Simplicity itself. Uh, you'll recall the care with which Captain Morstan preserved that map. Mm -hmm. A link to the treasure is highly probable, particularly in view of the cross and other directions. Indications as to its original hiding place. Clearly, the four men who signed the document were also involved in the whole business. And of the four names, only one could possibly fit the dramatic face at the window that so hastened the late Major's demise. Why only one? Friend Thaddeus described the face as deathly pale. There was one Western name and three Indian. Who else could it have been? This is mere speculation. Oh, on the contrary. It's the only hypothesis which covers the facts. Major Sholto was living in fear. On at least one occasion, he attacked a one-legged man, a white man, mark you. It's no great feat to put these facts together with Sholto's old command of a convict guard and come up with the ex-prisoner, Jonathan Small. But what sort of a monster is this, Small? Using a child as an accomplice. Not a child, Watson. Not a child, but that footprint was tiny. And when you couple that with great agility and poisoned darts? Good God. A savage. A savage. It's incredible. Holmes, there may still be danger. It's not right that Miss Morstan should remain in this house. Our pair have flown. Nothing remains for them here. There's no danger now. Oh, good. But even so... I agree. You must escort her home. With pleasure. She lives in Camberwell, so it's not far. You're not accompanying us? What? Do you wish me to do so? I believe I can manage on my own. Oh, I'm certain of it. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll wait here and have a word with the servants. Hmm. 
You're not too tired to drive out again? By no means. Ah. I want to see this matter through. Excellent, excellent. Hmm. Ah. And we've had a stroke of luck. Mm -hmm. The smell you remarked on was creosote. There's a carboy of the stuff in that corner. It's cracked and leaking. And that's lucky? Oh, extremely. Our friend, the ally, has had the misfortune to tread in it. <laughs> now, after you've dropped Miss Morstan, go to this address and ask for Toby. Toby? Yeah. Uh, I'd rather have his help than that of the whole detective force of London, man. Ah, a dog. Yes. <laughs> In the meanwhile, I shall study the methods of the great Jones. Oh, here's a business. Here's a pretty <laughs> business. <laughs> Holmes? Huh? My dear fellow? Extraordinary, isn't it? Just this morning, you were complaining that everything on the planet was commonplace. And you could think of nothing but myself poisoning by cocaine. Yes. Yeah. And Miss Morstan had not yet come to both our rescues. What do you really think of her? Uh, Watson, a client to me is a mere unit, a factor in a problem. I think, my friend, that she is one of the most charming and capable young ladies I have ever met. And one of the wealthiest. <laughs> Take her home, Watson. Dr. Watson? Yes, Miss Morstan? What is the matter? Why won't you talk to me? Please tell me, have I offended you in some way? No. Earlier tonight, in the garden, when you took my hand, it is forward of me to speak this way, I know it, but I thought... I should not have done it. Forgive me. Forgive you? What are you saying? I had no right. No right? If you had not done it, if you had not been there, I should have fled from that terrible house. It was your presence that gave me strength. What is there to forgive? Miss Morstan. Yes? I, I'm, I'm sorry. I can't explain. You must not ask me to. I'm so sorry. I'm not generally given to bursting into tears. You must think me a weak, stupid woman. On the contrary. I know you to be nothing of the kind. You're suffering from a mild case of delayed shock. It's entirely understandable after what you've been through. Thank you. And for escorting me home. There's a light still on. Someone has waited up for you. Yes. Probably Mrs. Forrester. Miss Morstan. Yes? You must not think me unfeeling. I think you are very kind and very troubled. If I can help. I... I do not believe so. If you should change your mind... Good night, Dr. Watson. Good night. How could I obtrude love upon her at such a time? She was tired and vulnerable, shaken in mind and nerve. And worse still, she was rich. If Holmes's researches were successful and the treasure recovered, she would be an heiress. Was it fair? Was it honourable that a half-pay surgeon should take advantage of an intimacy which mere chance had brought about? 
Might she not think me a mere vulgar fortune seeker? I could not bear to risk that such a thought should cross her mind. I stole a glance back, and in my mind I still seem to see that picture. The graceful figure on the step, the half-open door, the hall light shining through stained glass, the barometer, and the bright stair rods. It was soothing to catch even that passing glimpse of a tranquil English home in the midst of the wild, dark business which had absorbed us. Then the carriage turned corner, and it was gone. We rattled away through the silent, gaslit streets. That was part one of The Sign of the Fall by Sir Arthur Conan. Miss Mary Morstan was at the center of a wild and dark adventure. The tale of a fabulous Indian treasure that had passed from hand to hand, leaving only death and misery in its wake. A quarter of a million in gold and jewels was rightfully hers, but the treasure chest was stolen and its last owner horribly murdered. Holmes and I were on the track of as curious a pair of villains as we'd ever encountered, and the thrill of the chase should have been in my heart but my heart and my mind were elsewhere. My sympathies and my love had gone out to her. Yet, if the treasure were recovered, Mary Morstan would be a rich woman. And what right had a half-pay surgeon to look at an heiress? Such were my gloomy thoughts as I pursued my errand for Sherlock Holmes in the quiet, early morning streets of London. Hello? Hello? Go on, get a jet drunk and wake up on... Uh, Mr. Sherman? So help me gracious, I've got a wiper in this bag. A poisonous wiper. It's a dog I've come about. Go on, or I'll drop the wiper on your head. All I uh, want... I won't be argued with. Will I say three? Down comes the wiper. <laughs> One, if you'll just listen for a moment. Two terrible fangs he's got. I've come from Mr Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, what? What? Well, why the devil didn't you say so? Yes, why the devil didn't I say so? Uh, a friend of Mr Sherlock is always welcome, sir. Now, quiet, Alexander. Step, step in, sir. Step in, step in. Thank you. That's it. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Keep clear of the badger, sir. E boy. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry, sir. That was one of the stoats. Stoats. <laughs> uh, naughty, naughty. <laughs> Would you take a nip at the gentleman? <laughs> Here, oh, mind where you're stepping, if you please. Yeah, why? Of course, up the slow worm, sir. Slow worm? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, oh no, it's all right, he's gone. <laughs> yeah, you can put your foot down now. Oh. I've come from... You've come from Mr Sherlock. Yes, that's right. And what was it that Mr Sherlock wanted, sir? A dog of yours. A dog? Ah, yes, that'd be Toby. Hello, Toby. <laughs> ah, Toby has the finest nose in London. Haven't you, boy? Yes. Is Inspector Jones still here? Uh, no. The official force have departed, um, save for one constable. Uh, Jones arrested not only friend Thaddeus, but also the housekeeper, the gatekeeper, and the Indian servant. Well, what about your description of the two men? Well, the worthy inspector regards me as a more fanciful spinner of fictions even than you. <laughs> well, Mr. Theorist, you can go off in search of your one-legged man and his accomplice. I've got the murderer right here. You see if I haven't. <laughs> And off the whole caravan went. <laughs> now, are you game for a trudge? Certainly. Huh. Uh, your leg will stand it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Good man, good man. Now, Toby, smell this, Toby. 
Oh, smell it. Mm, creosote. Uh, from the broken jar at the site of the murder. Our diminutive friend with the pleasant habits left tar-stained footprints all across the roof. Yes, but enough should have stayed on his foot for Toby to track him for us. <laughs> Come on, doggy. Now, that's where he came down. Oh, what did I tell you? <laughs> Goodbye. Come on, Watson. We've got them. <laughs> Holmes, will he really be able to follow their trail after all this time? Never doubt him, Watson. Go on, Toby. You see, not a falter. That's incredible. Ah, this trail makes it all too easy. It takes away any credit that might have been gained out of the case. Uh, there is credit and to spare. Well, then most of it should go to Toby. <laughs> I think Toby's just lost his reputation for infallibility. Well, you can't deny he's traced some creosote. Yeah, about two dozen barrels of the stuff. A sawmill. <laughs> Good dog. Well, he's acted according to his lights. Well, if you consider how much creosote is carted about London in one day, it's no great wonder that our trail should have been crossed. <laughs> Uh, poor Toby's not to blame. Ah, back at the corner of Knight's place, where he hesitated. Yes, that must be where he took the wrong path. Well, it should be easy enough to pick up the right one. Uh, he'll probably take us straight to wherever these barrels come from. Now, really, Watson, you'll offend him. <laughs> Go on, boy. <laughs> Ah, oh, we're out of luck. The trail leads down to the water's edge, then stops. <laughs> They've taken a boat from here. No, oh, damn! You were sure this is the correct trail? Oh, yes. Didn't you notice how we kept on the pavement this time? Oh, this is it, all right. Mordecai Smith, boats to hire. Hmm, ramshackle sort of place. A steam launch available. Yes, this begins to look bad. Well, these fellows are sharper than I expected. I'm afraid there's been preconcerted management here. Shall we ask if anyone remembers seeing them? Always the subtle approach. Hey, what? Oh, what do you suggest we do? Jack, where are you? You come here and be washed, you little brooch. Good morning. Oh, oh, good morning, gentlemen. What might you be wanting? I hope to speak to Mr. Smith. My man's not here, sir. But if it was about a boat, maybe I could serve as well. I wanted to hire his steam launch. Oh, why bless you. It's in the steam launch that has gone off on some rush job in the middle of the night. But he can't have gone far, for there's not enough coal aboard to take him much past Woolwich and back. I particularly wanted the steam launch. Uh, I I've heard good reports of her. The, um... She, what is it? The Aurora, sir. Yeah, that's it. Uh, the old green launch, very broad in the beam. No. Oh, indeed. She's as trim a little thing as you'll see on the river. Fresh painted, too. Uh, black, with two red streaks. Ah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll inquire again for Mr Smith. Uh, sounds like just the boat for me. Will you be wanting her soon, sir? Fairly soon. Only someone else was asking after her a couple of days since. But not a gentleman like yourself. A nasty piece of work, if you ask me. Ugly face and outlandish talk. Oh, if they turn me up. I never could abide a peg leg. By heaven, Holmes. It's the unofficial force. The Baker Street Irregulars. I tell you, you can't go in. It's all right, Mrs. Hudson. They're my guests. How many times do I have to ask you? Uh, Wigan. Tension! Thank you. This used to be a respectable house. I got your message, sir, and I brought them on sharp. Yeah, so I see. Three bob and a tanner for tickets. Uh, here you are. Oh, oh, Jack, give us silence, sir. Wiggins will sort it out later. Now, you're to look for the steam launch Aurora. Black with two red streaks, very trim, owner Mordecai Smith. <laughs>
is along the river somewhere, and let me know the moment you've news. Is that clear? The Aurora. Yes, Governor. Everyone got that? The usual scale of pay, and a guinea to the one who finds the boat. Oh, no, uh, here's a day in advance. Uh, now, off you go. Oh, God. Off you go. Well, come on. You won't know your money's name in here. Get moving. If the launch is above water, they'll find her. <laughs> I expect to hear something by this evening. Hmm. There's no more we can do till then. <sighs> oh, Toby could eat those scraps, I dare say. Yes, if Mrs Hudson hasn't already fed him to overflowing. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll get some sleep. Are you going to bed? No, uh, I'm not tired. I have a curious constitution. I never remember feeling tired by work. You know, it's idleness that exhausts me completely. So what will you do? Well, I'm going to smoke and think over this queer business. Mm. You know, this hunt ought to be an easy task. I suppose wooden-legged men are not so common. And the other man must, I think, be absolutely unique. Mm. Now, where would it be? Which one? Which one? Tiny footmarks, mm. naked feet, great agility, poison darts. A savage. Hmm. But here in London... Yes, evidently. This point of origin is of some relevance. Ah, ah, yes, here it is. The Aborigines of the Andaman Islands. Boston and Sholto's posting. May perhaps claim the distinction of being the smallest race upon this earth. They're a fierce, morose and intractable people, though capable of forming most devoted friendships when their confidence has been gained. Mark that, Watson. Mm. Is there any more? Oh, yes. They've always been a terror to shipwreck crews, braining the survivors with their stone-headed clubs or shooting them with poisoned darts. <laughs> These massacres are invariably concluded by a cannibal feast. <laughs> nice, amiable people. Mary? What is it, Mrs. Forrester? What's wrong? I'm worried about you, my dear. About me? There's no need. Are you sure you're all right? After all you went through yesterday? I'm perfectly all right. I'm a little tired, that's all. <laughs> yes, so am I. It was kind of you to wait up for me. Oh, that letter was so intriguing. I had to find out what happened. But in my wildest dreams, I never expected such a tale. No, nor I. What will happen next, I wonder? Dr Watson promised that he would let me know as soon as he had some news. Ah, so we can expect another visit from that young man. I rather thought we might. Mrs Forrester. This time, Mary, do try to get him into the house. I want to see what he's like. What do you mean you can't find it? It ain't there. It has to be there. I'm sorry, Governor. Uh, no, I, I'm sorry, Wiggins. Keep up the search. Call back here any hour. Yes, sir. Yes, we must find her, Wiggins. We will, Miss Rose. Don't worry. Bye. Goodbye. Oh. Uh. Oh. Holmes? Ah, they can't find the launch. Oh. Can I do anything? I'm perfectly fresh now. I've had some sleep. No, no, we can only wait. I shall stay here in case of developments. Ah. I shall run over to Camberwell before dinner and call upon Mrs Forrester. Mrs Forrester? Uh, you, well, on Miss Morstan, too. Ah, yes. She'll be anxious to hear what's happened. Well, I wouldn't tell her much. Women are never to be entirely trusted, not the best of them. That is an atrocious sentiment, and I've no intention of pausing to argue it with I you. I assure you that the most winning woman I ever knew was hanged for poisoning her three little children for their insurance I money. hardly think that's relevant in this case. It's... I never make exceptions. An exception disproves the rule. Oh, you're impossible sometimes. Yes, I know. Now, if you're crossing the river, you may as well return Toby. Mm. I don't know if he can still walk after Mrs Hudson's attentions. Very well. And Watson. Yes? Good luck. I held up the lantern, and there, in the dust, I could see them. The footprints of the second intruder. They were tiny. Tiny? Like a child's 
But this was no child. Then what in the world? A pygmy. A cannibal pygmy. Oh, great heavens! I should have fainted clean away. There are pygmies on the Andaman Islands. My father used to speak of them. Yes, that's where we think he's from. And the other man, too. The man with the wooden leg. Holmes and I believe him to be Jonathan Small, whose name appears on that old document of Captain Morstan's. And now you have to find the two of them. Yes, for the moment they've given us the slip. But we know that they're planning to get away by boat. The Aurora. Oh, you're so clever to have worked all this out. Oh, it's not me. It's Holmes. I'm sure you are underestimating yourself, Dr Watson. <laughs> No, really, I mean it. You're very kind. So much depends on this search, Mary. Your fortune. I don't think you're nearly excited enough. Just imagine what it must be like to be so rich and have the world at your feet. It is for Mr Thaddeus Sholto that I am most anxious. He has behaved so kindly and so honourably. Dr Watson, you and Mr Holmes must clear him of this dreadful charge. We shall. Never fear. Do you know it's like a romance? A wronged lady, a treasure, a black cannibal and a wooden-legged villain. And two knights errant to the rescue. Ah, good evening, Mrs Hudson. Good evening, Doctor. Oh, dear. No callers? Not a one, sir. No news, then? No. And to speak truthfully, Doctor, I'm afraid for his health. He's been acting very strange. In what way? Walking up and down, never stopping, then talking to himself and shouting away like nobody's business. Now he's slammed off to his room. Mm, we've seen him like this before, Mrs Hudson. Just so long as he's not going to be ill again, I couldn't stand that, you know. I know. But I don't think he need worry. Not so long as he's involved in a case. And he knows my views on the subject now, too. Well, I pray God you're right. To be plain with you, Doctor, I don't think he realises how lucky he is having you here to look after him. Oh, Mrs Hudson. Yes. Well, have you had your dinner, sir? Uh, no, I haven't. What about Mr Holmes? I asked him what he wanted. To be left alone, he said, and not bothered with inessentials. <laughs> inessentials, indeed. I'll have something ready for you in about 20 minutes, Doctor. <sighs> I don't suppose we'll see Mr Holmes again before breakfast. Good morning. Yeah. What the devil are you looking for? My clay pipe. Isn't it behind the clock, as usual? Yeah, don't be ridiculous. Ah! The coal scuttle. Yes, your powers of observation never cease to amaze me. I heard you marching about in the night. <clears throat> this infernal business is consuming me. You're locking yourself up, old man. Did you get any sleep at all? <sighs> it's too much to be balked by so petty an obstacle when we've come so far. And the men, the launch, everything. And yet I can get no news. Mm. Have some coffee. No, no, thank you. Is it possible that we've missed them? That they've already flown? No, no. They're still here. How can you be so sure? They're still here. But it will be soon, Watson. Oh, yeah. Soon. <clears throat> I'm going out. Oh, at least have something to eat yeah, Later. Uh, now, I want you to open all notes and telegrams and to act on your own judgment if any news should come. Now, can I rely on you? Oh, of course you can. Yes. Ah, good. I don't know when I'll be back. It's a neat little craft town. Aye, she is that right enough. Yeah. Never had her like when I was on the river. Yeah, she's a pretty turn of speed, I dare say. <laughs> uh, what was she in for then? Well, repair to her rudder. Ah. Oh. Looks all ship shape to me. And me too. There ain't naught amiss with a rudder nor anything else. Waste of my time. Jacobson! And here's the cause of it. Hear me, Jacobson! They can hear you in Greenwich, Smith. She's his, is she? Look at him. Don't deserve a craft like this. Yeah, criminal. Will she be ready? She's ready now, Smith. 
She's been ready these two days. Don't want her now. Eight o'clock tonight, Jacobson. And sharp mind of a gentleman who won't be kept waiting. <laughs> Mrs. Forrester stared at her. Why, Mary, think of your fortune. Just imagine what it must be like to be so rich and have the world at your feet. It sent a thrill of joy to my heart to notice that she showed no sign of elation at the prospect. On the contrary, she gave a toss of her head as though the matter were one, in which she took a small... Interest. Ah, good. Hello? Who's that? I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Holmes is out. Well, uh, do you know what time he'll be back? I'm afraid not, sir. Inspector! Hmm? Good afternoon. It's all right, Mrs. Hudson. I know the gentleman. Come up. Why, uh, thank you, Doctor. No, no, it's all right, madam. I believe I can find a way unaided. <laughs> I am a detective. <laughs> well, good day, sir. Good day. Oh. Mr. Sherlock Holmes is out, I understand. Yes, and I can't be sure when he'll be back. But perhaps you care to wait. Come in. Oh, thank you. Take that chair. Try one of these cigars. <laughs> Thank you. I don't mind if I do. <laughs> and a whiskey and water? Well, uh, half a glass. Oh. It is very hot for the time of year, and uh, I've had a good deal to worry and try me. You know my theory about this Norwood case. Ah, I remember that you expressed one. Well, uh, I've been obliged to reconsider it. So, you no longer believe Thaddeus Sholto murdered his brother? No, thank you, Doctor. No, no, I don't. I had my net drawn tightly round him when, pop, he went through a hole in the middle. He had an alibi. Oh, an unshakable one. From the time that he left his brother's room, he was never once out of sight of someone or other. I've had to let him go. Good. Frankly, Inspector, I don't understand how you could ever have suspected him in the first place. Mm -hmm. The thought of Thaddeus Sholto climbing over the roof and through that skylight... Well, well, he's been eliminated now. And the old housekeeper, too. It's a very dark case. And to be candid with you, I should be glad of a little assistance. <laughs> My professional credit is at stake. Well, we all need help sometimes. It's only a fool who's too proud to admit the fact. Well, very true, sir, very true. And your friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, is a wonderful man. Huh? He's a man who is not to be beat. Bit too quick in jumping to theory, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> what the <laughs> devil? Good Lord. What do you mean by this intrusion, my man? <laughs> Is one of you two Holmes? It's Mr. Holmes to the likes of you. Ah, not you. You don't look nothing like a detective. <laughs> Are you him? Huh? Well, uh, what exactly is the meaning of this? Ah, uh, you'll find out. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Are you Holmes? No, I'm acting for him. You can give me any message. <laughs> Quickly now. <laughs> I know where the boat is, and the treasure and all. You know where the treasure is? I'm not talking to you. Now, see here, my good man. I suggest you keep a civil tongue in your head. This is Inspector Athelney Jones of Scotland Yard. Never heard of him. <laughs> I'll wait for Holmes. All right with you, whoever you are. Very well. No more of your rudeness. Do you understand? You can sit quietly in that corner. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they say at the yard that Mr. Holmes gets a lot of his information from the lowest areas of society. So it's true, then, is it, Doctor? Well... Mm, I understand. We all have our professional secrets. Still, however irregular he may be in his methods, I think he would have made a most promising police officer. And I don't care who knows it. A policeman? That must must be flattered. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> you rogue! <laughs> you would have made an actor and a rare one. You had the proper workhouse cough. Oh. And those weak legs of yours are worth ten pound a week. <laughs> and you, I thought I knew the glint in your eye. But 
Why are you done up like that? Uh, the men who work on the river are a, a tight-lipped band. Oh, and they'll speak freely enough to one of their own. Then you really <laughs> have found the boat. Yeah. Now, listen, Jones. Yes? I can give you your murderers, but it must be on my terms. What do you mean? Uh, firstly, you're welcome to all the official credit, but you must put yourself and your men entirely under my orders. Is that agreed? If you can help me to the men... Then... I've just said that I can. Then I agree. Uh, secondly, when we secure the men, we shall get the treasure. The box must not be touched until the doctor here has fetched the young lady to whom half of it rightfully belongs. Holmes. She must be the first to open it. Hey, Watson. It would be a great pleasure to me. Now, that's an extremely irregular proceeding. Well, if you'd rather continue on your own... Well, you... well, the whole thing is irregular. But afterwards, the treasure must be handed over to the authorities until the official investigation is concluded. Certainly, that's easily managed. And I agree. Now, how exactly do we proceed? Thirdly... Mr. Holmes... Thirdly... I should like to hear the remaining details about this matter from the lips of Jonathan Small himself. Here. In my rooms. I have had no proof yet of the existence of this Jonathan Small. However, well, if you can catch him, I, I don't see how I can refuse you. Excellent. Are there any other conditions? Ah, uh, not at the moment. <laughs> now, this is what I need. This is the fastest police launch on the river. Uh, is there anything to mark it as a police boat? Constable? Uh, yes, sir. The green lamp at the stern. Uh, then take it off. Well, go on, man. Yes, Inspector. Uh, that's better. Are you sure this is the fastest craft available? Well, so I'm assured. You didn't give me much in the way of notice. We shall have to catch the Aurora. She's the name for being a clipper. Where did you find her in the end? A boat isn't the easiest thing to conceal. Ah, I was a fool not to have thought of it earlier. Think, Watson. She had to be out of sight but ready for departure with a minimum of preparation. Are boat builders or repairers? They have sheds and huts which open onto the water. Yes, exactly. Well, simple. It's the simple things which are extremely likely to be overlooked. How long did it take you to find the right one? Well, Jacobson's was the 16th repair yard I tried. There was the Aurora, and there was her owner, too. <laughs> Rather the worst for liquor. He obligingly provided me with small departure time. Eight o'clock tonight. Well, it'll be full dark by then. Yes, but it's a clear night. We shall be able to see easily. How powerful is that searchlight? Powerful enough. Yes, we're coming to Jacobson's yard. Did you bring the night glasses, Watson? Ah. Here. Thank you. <laughs> what can you make out? I have a boy stationed at the water's edge. He'll signal us when they arrive. Well, you've planned it all very neatly, whether they are the right men or not. But if the affair were in my hands, I should have had a body of officers in that yard and arrested them when they came down. Which would have been never. Uh, this man, Small, is a pretty shrewd fella. One whiff of the official force, and he'd have flown. What's that? Oh, it's the signal! So, they're in the yard! Uh, not no longer. Uh, there's the Aurora. Already underway. And going like the devil. Engineer, full speed ahead. She's flying along. More speed. My heaven, I'll never forgive myself if she has the heels of us. I doubt if we'll catch her. We must catch her. Keep it on, Stubbers. If we burn the boat, we must have them. I think we're gaining a little. I'm sorry. Jones, get a man on that searchlight. No, no, I'll do it myself. Keep the light steady, Jones. There he is, a one-legged man. Jonathan Small. You're still making ground on them. Is that a dog he's got there? That's no dog. Watch him. Use this. By God. What? Well, what the devil is it? Can't we go any faster? More steam! Stop! In the Queen's name! This is a police vessel! They heard you! He's firm! John Bethewe! Do you still think that's a dog, Jones? Give me those glasses! Have your gun ready, Watson! Mm. Look at that! And to think I didn't believe you, Mr. Holmes! Uh, there's no time for that now! What's going on there? What's small is huddled over something. It looks like a box. A treasure chest? 
Yes, it must be. What's he doing? Never mind him. And what are the creature? He's standing up. He's got some kind of pipe. Fire, Watson! You got the little savage! Small! Give yourself up! Never! Now what's he doing? He's trying to take the rudder. They're fighting for control of the boat. Stop! In the name of the law! She's turning! We're going to wrap her! Oh, stop! By God, she's going aground! There goes Small! Pull into the bank! Let's get after him! Oh, there's no hurry. He's got the treasure! I can't make it across the mud. Let him wear himself out. <laughs> ah, there. Damn you! Damn you to hell! I wish I'd been there. It was very dangerous. And not pleasant. No, of course not. I'm very glad that you weren't hurt. Thank you. So, the treasure has truly been recovered at last. Yes. The great Agra treasure, as Small called it. I'm amazed that the police allowed it to be taken to your rooms. <laughs> Holmes is a very persuasive man. I can imagine. Think, Miss Morstan. Half of that treasure is yours. Hundreds of thousands of pounds. Isn't it wonderful? If I have it, I owe it to you. No, not to me. To Sherlock Holmes. To both of you. You have been so kind to me, and I have placed you in such horrible peril. I am so sorry. Oh, that's all over now. Miss Morstan? Yes? When we get to Baker Street, Jonathan Small will be there. He'll be under guard, of course, but even so... Dr. Watson, you're very kind to be concerned, but I shall have my knight's errand to protect me. How could I be afraid? Uh, greetings, Miss Morstan. Ah, Watson. Hmm. Uh, come in, come in. Uh, I must apologise for the policeman in the hallway, Miss Morstan. Mrs. Hudson will be quick to inform you this is usually a most respectable household. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Holmes. I don't believe you know the eminent Inspector Athelny Jones of Scotland Yard, Miss Mary Morstan. Miss mm, Morstan? Inspector, I've been hearing all about you from Dr. Watson. Oh, I told her how I captured the criminal, did you, Doctor? Oh, something of the sort, yes. And how I recovered the treasure? <laughs> <laughs> be quiet, you. You must be Mr. Jonathan Small. Good evening, sir. You knew my father, I believe. I did, miss. And a fair and true-spoken gentleman he was. Pray take a seat, Miss Morstan. Mr. Small was about to enlighten us with his history. I give you my word on the book. But I never raised hand against young Bartholomew Sholto. We know it. Your diminutive accomplice shot him with his blowpipe as he came down the ladder from the secret room. You were still waiting below for the rope. <laughs> you seem to know as much about it as if you were there. As wild with little Tonga. But it was done and I couldn't undo it again. Now, if it had been old Major Sholto, I'd have swum for him with a light heart. But to be lagged for the sun is cursed hard. I had no quarrel with him. Now, look, just give us the facts, Small, and let us make up our own minds on the matter. Here. Ah, thank you. Mm. Well, Mr Sherlock Holmes... If you want to hear my story, I've no wish to hold it back. Though I can see it's you I have to thank for these uh, bracelets. Just get on with it, Small. <laughs> when I was a lad, I got into a mess over a girl. I could only get out of it by taking the Queen's shilling and joining the third buffs, which was just setting out for India. I wasn't destined to do much soldiering, though. I was fool enough to go swimming in the Ganges and a crocodile nipped my leg off for me. Neat as any surgeon could have done. With a shock in the infection, I was five months in hospital for it. And I emerged with this. Embittered out, and a cripple at twenty. Mm, Ganges is pure poison. You were lucky to have recovered at all. I know it. 
Uh, it's a strange thing, but despite what had happened, I liked India. I had some friends over there, so I stayed and got myself fixed up with a job. And then, without warning, the great mutiny was on us. One minute, all India was still and peaceful as Surrey or Kent. The next, there were 200,000 black devils let loose. We all know our history, Small. Are you going to let me tell this my own way or not? Yeah. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. I went for safety to the old fort at Agra. It was the nearest city still held by the British. Uh, it's a very queer old place, the fort. Full of deserted halls and winding passages and hundreds of rooms where nobody goes anymore. The city was swarming with every kind of fanatic and devil worshipper. But the fort was short-handed when it came to dependable men. Each gate was put under the charge of a white man and a couple of trustworthy natives. I had two Punjabis under my command. Good men they were too. Abdullah Khan and Mohammed Singh. We had the night watch at one of the quietest gates. It was generally peaceful enough. And I never got much in the way of conversation out of my men. So it was easy to let my attention drift. Too easy. What the devil? Nick, no sound. You treacherous. No sound. Or you will never draw breath again. Sing. Remove his rifle. Good. I will take my knife away now. Make no alarm if you wish to continue living. Uh, so, you are in league with the rebels after all. No, oh, sir. We are loyal and the fort is safe. Then what the devil do you think you're doing? Listen to me. You must either be with us now or you must be silenced forever. Which is it to be? How can I decide? I don't know what this is about. We ask you to be rich. Rich? Is that not why your countryman came to this land? If you will join with us, you shall be rich. A quarter of the treasure shall be yours. What treasure? And why a quarter? There are only three of us. Our companion Dost Akbar must have his share. I have no objection to being rich. How do I know I can trust you? One quarter shall be yours, Jonathan Small. I swear it upon the naked knife and by the threefold oath. That's a powerful oath. One of the highest a seek and swear. Yes, I knew that well. It showed me how serious a matter this was. So you betrayed your own people, Small. No, I did no such thing. Is any more of that whiskey? Yes. Thank you. There we are. Thank you. I asked them again if the fort and the people in it were in any sort of danger. And again they said no. And I believed them. Are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. The three have become the four. But I'll do nothing until I know more details. There is a local Raja with much wealth. He has gone in with the rebels, but he is a careful man and trusts no one completely. Half of his treasure he plans to hide. Hide where? Here in this fort. What? If the white men are victorious, he can regain it. He has many friends here at Agra. And many who are not his friends. Are you saying that the treasure is here now? No. The Raja's trusted servant is due here this night. He brings it. This man we must kill. You said nothing of killing. Consider, Sahib. If this matter becomes known, the man will be hung or shot and the jewels taken by the government. Why should this be? When there is wealth enough there to make us rich men and great chiefs. Which gate will this man use? Dost Akbar travels with him. He will lead him here to us. Then we will do what must be done. They needed my help because they knew they'd never get the treasure inside the fort without someone somewhere turning a blind eye. You turned your blind eye to a murder. Yes, I did. And I've had to live with it. That's been punishment enough. It is finished. The body must not be found. A place has been prepared. Come, and Jonathan Small. Come and see the treasure. Oh, the treasure. It was blinding to look on. The 143 diamonds of the first water, among them, the Great Mogul. The second largest stone in existence. <laughs> now, your Raja was wealthy indeed. I hope you've a trustworthy man with that box, Jones. 
Then there were 97 emeralds, 170 rubies, 40 carbuncles, 210 sapphires, 61 agates. And there were gold and silver and pearls, pearls such as I'd never seen. The old major must have had an eye for pearls. The finest set was missing when I recovered the chest. I suppose he sold them or gambled them away. No, Mr Small. His son, Thaddeus Sholto, sent them to me. You've got them? Good. That's very good. Very right. You are in no position to moralise, Small. Just get on with your story. You buried the treasure chest in one of the deserted parts of the old fort until the troubles were over and you could retrieve it without exciting comment. It seems to me you can tell this better than I can. And you drew up a map showing its location. We had one each. One for each of the four. We swore in our lives that whichever one of us eventually recovered the hoard, he would seek out the other three and divide it equally. And that's how it's always been with me. I said I was with them, and I've stuck to my word. Everything I've done was for the four. And what went wrong? Oh, the body was found. We should have burned it. Agba said we should. And we were arrested. Three of us because we held the nearest gate, and Agba because he'd been travelling with the murdered man. Well, didn't the matter of the treasure come out of the trail? <laughs> no. <laughs> the old Raja had long since been deposed by his rebel friends, and killed like as not, so it stayed where it was, safely buried. What was the outcome of the trial, Mr Small? Guilty, miss, all four of us. Penal servitude for life. At the prison colony in the Andaman Islands. Yeah, living stinking hell. <laughs> Keep working! You there! Prisoner Small. Captain! You're coming with me. Guard? Sir? Unchain this prisoner. Sir? That was your father, miss. Captain Morstan. He saw me all right. More than I deserved, I dare say. But a white prisoner was a rarity. He got me a, a cushy job in the dispensary. And I was pretty much given the run of the place so long as I behaved myself. I knew better than to queer that pitch. I knew when I was well off. I tried to get the captain to make things easier for the rest of the four, but it was more than he could risk. Major Sholto wouldn't have stood for it for a minute. Major Sholto was my father's friend. He was a hard man. Bitter. He and the captain were great ones for gaming. The prison officers and the guards were forever at cards or at dice. But old Sholto, <laughs> he never had the look. It's all up, Morstan. I shall have to send him a papers. I'm a ruined man. Nonsense. Look, I've had a nasty face on myself or I'd help you out again, but your luck's due for a turn. Ride it out. I tell you, I'm ruined. What can I do? Well, perhaps I can put together a little... <coughs> Shorter? Who's there? Who's skulking in the shadows? It's me, Major. Jonathan Small. Now, what do you mean by spying on me, eh? Morstan, have this man whipped in the morning. Now, wait a minute, old chap. Small, what do you want? I know where there's half a million in jewels buried. What did you say? I think you heard me. Half a million in jewels and gold, and the rightful owner dead. Where? Where is it? Hold on, Sholto. Dead, you say? Hey, it's anyone's for the taking. All's above board. Are you asking us to bargain with you? Bargain? With a damn prisoner? Well, if that's the way of it, Major, I'll be on my way. But wait. What sort of bargain? If there's only one bargain a man in my position can make. Freedom for me and my three companions. And in return? We'll take the two of you into our partnership. A fifth share to divide between you. A fifth? Fifty thousand apiece. Easy. We can't just release you, Small. Or your friends. We have our superiors too, you know. And our oaths. I don't ask that. I'll leave a boat and some provisions in one of the coves and don't report us missing for a week after we've gone. That's all you need sully your hands with. You. We'll do it for you, not the others. All or none. We've sworn it. We act as the four or not at all. We'll need some proof. You have our word. The word of a convicted killer and three black thugs. Cool down, Sholto. We must consider this. I have a daughter at home to support. You've two sons. Or do you want to resign your commission and go back to them in disgrace? He agreed, of course. We had another meeting the next night. The two officers and the four. We made them swear the vow. And I gave them each a copy of the map. I have my father's copy still. What? <laughs> I never thought to see that again. 
So the captain kept it safe all these years. He would have held to his word, not like Sholto. Sholto betrayed you. He disappeared suddenly from the prison. He was the officer in charge. It must have been easy for him to arrange it. And pretty soon news came back to us that he'd gone straight to Agra and dug up the treasure. He wanted everything for himself. His oath meant nothing. And then he retired from the army and came back home to England. Yeah, and left us to rot. Did my father not help you? No, he wanted to. He was as furious at what had happened as the rest of us. But a new commanding officer replaced Sholto, and the captain was helpless. And from that time on, I was wild for vengeance. To track down Sholto, to have my hands around his throat. That was my one thought. I escaped. You befriended the native pygmy. He was staunch and true, was little Tonga. A better man than Sholto for all his savagery. Yeah, he was brought into my dispensary near to death with a fever, and I managed to save him. <laughs> he fastened on to me. No man ever had a more faithful mate. He got me away, yeah, <laughs> in his fishing boat. Well, how did you get past the guards without a weapon? <laughs> without a weapon? A wooden leg makes a fine club, my friend, if you can balance upright long enough to use it. And Tonga had his darts and his blowpipe. Yes, we've seen the effects of that little toy. Well, I told you that was none of my doing. Look, let's get on with this. You got away from the island, and then what? Yeah, ten days we were beating about, trusting to look. And on the 11th, we were picked up by a trader with a cargo of Malay pilgrims. Malay pilgrims have one very good quality, Mr Holmes. They let you alone, and they don't ask questions. Uh, how long did it take you to get to England? Years. But I never lost sight of my purpose. I dream of Sholto at night. A hundred times I killed him in my sleep. And we got here. There was no great difficulty in finding where he lived. Clearly, you had an informant inside the household. I'm naming no names. I still have the gatekeeper and the Indian servant in custody. Oh, congratulations. You may actually have arrested a criminal for once. I had a word that Sholto was dying. I went round there, mad at the thought that he was going to escape my vengeance. But in a way, he didn't. The sight of your face at the window brought on the final crisis. Yes. <laughs> and don't think I didn't enjoy the thought of it. But I had to have the treasure. I broke in and searched for some clue to what he'd done with it, but there was nothing. I left him my calling card. The sign of the four. Yeah, so we know the truth of it. The treasure was still intact, hidden away somewhere. Sholto's sons were obligingly looking for it for me. So it was a waiting game. I scratched a living by showing little Tonga at fairs, the black cannibal. He'd eat raw meat and dance his war dance. You waited seven years. I'd have waited 70. But eventually word came it had been found. And I think you know the rest of it well enough. No, oh, we do. So... Now you know how badly I was served by that villain Sholto and how innocent I am of the death of his son. I swear that every word I've spoken has been God's own truth. A very remarkable account. And now I think we should see this great Agra treasure that has spilled so much blood and caused so much grief. Well, my sergeant is just outside. <laughs> Don't you move a muscle, Small. Bring it in here, if you please, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Friend Small threw the key into the Thames, Miss Morstan. But a poker and some brute force will serve just as well. Here you are, Watson. Mm -hmm. This is beautiful. It's a shame to damage it. But now it's metalwork. I should be able to force just the glass. Go ahead, Miss Morstan. Open it. This treasure has caused nothing but misery and death. No longer. Open it. Very well. <laughs> no, 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 this is no laughing matter. Where is it? What have you done with it? I'll oh. put it where you'll never lay your thieving hands on it. No living man had any claim on that treasure save the last members of the four. And if we can't have it, then no one shall. It's at the bottom of the Thames with my poor Tonga. 
Then the treasure is lost forever. Forever. Thank God. Now, this is a very serious matter, and it will go against you thwarting justice like this. Justice? What justice have I had? All my companions, justice. Well, Mr. Holmes. Well, Inspector. You are a man to be humoured, there's no doubt. And we all know that you are a connoisseur of crime, but duty is duty, and I must be getting on with things in a more official manner now. Well, of course you must. Thank you for your indulgence, Jones. Take the prisoner away, Sergeant. Right, sir. Come on in, my lad. Ah, get your hands off me, ah. I'm coming. Well, miss, gentlemen, a very good night to you. Mr. Small. Miss Morstan. I'm very pleased that you did what you did. Thank you. There's much of your father in you. He was a good man. I'm glad you got the pearls. Thank you. When you wear them, remember the four. There's a light still on. Mrs. Forrester has waited up for you. She can hardly be expecting the tale I have to tell. No. Miss Morstan? Yes, Dr. Watson? The last time we stood here together, there were many things I wanted to say to you, but could not. I knew you were troubled. I offered to help if I could. You cannot know how much that offer meant to me. Are you troubled still? No. No longer. Not since you opened the treasure chest and found it empty. There were two detectives in that room. But I'm sure that neither of them observed what I observed at that moment. They were concerned about the jewels. While I cared nothing for them. And so, only I heard you say, thank God. Why did you say that, Dr. Watson? I think you know why. I think I do, but I'd like to hear you say it. I said, thank God. Because with the treasure lost, you were within my reach. Because at last I could tell you that I love you, Mary. I love you as truly as ever a man loved a woman. Then, my dear John, I say thank God too. Come in, Watson. I thought you'd gone to bed. Why on earth are you sitting in the dark? Oh. You delivered her safely home? Yes. Well, that's the end of our... Little drama. Hmm. I'm afraid. Are you? I'm afraid it may be the last chance I shall have to study your methods. Miss Morstan has done me the honour to accept me as a husband in perspective. Holmes? I feared as much. I really cannot congratulate you. Have you any reason to be dissatisfied with my choice? Oh, not at all. Well, then. Love. Love is an emotional thing, and whatever is emotional is opposed to true cold reason. Which you place above everything else. Of course. I should never marry myself. I should like to see the woman who take you on. Lest I should bias my judgment. I trust that my judgment may survive the ordeal. You look weary. Yeah. The reaction... He's already upon me. 
I shall be as limp as a rag for a week. Still, what a case for the annals, eh? The sign of the four. Another tale of mystery and romance from the colourful pen of John H. Watson. Starring the incomparable Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> mm. So, what will you do? Going to practice? Yes, I suppose so. It'll seem strange. After this... Well, I wish you joy. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, now that it's all over, the division seems rather unfair. Jones gets all the credit in this business. I get a wife out of it. What remains for you? For me, there still remains the cocaine bottle. Jonathan Small was played by Brian Blessed. Mary Morstan by Moya Leslie. Inspector Jones by Sean Probert. And Khan by Amajit Dew. Anna Cropper played Mrs. Hudson. Alan Dean, Wiggins. Michael Kilgariff, Major Sholto. John Bull, Singh. John Moffat, Sherman. Elizabeth Mansfield, Mrs. Forrester and Vincent Brimble, Jacobson. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Alexander Balanescu. The Sign of the Four was directed by Ian Cotterell and the producer was David Johnston. <laughs>